Chemical rockets have taken us to space for decades, but they're hitting a wall. Nine months to Mars, 90% of your ship is just fuel. Astronauts drowning in radiation the whole way. Now SpaceX is eyeing something radical. Nuclear-powered Starship. We're talking 52-day trips to Mars, triple the efficiency, in the same stainless steel beast we know, just with a reactor on board. But can Starship's design even handle nuclear power? And why is this suddenly on the table? Let's dive right in. Here's the brutal truth. Chemical rockets are dinosaurs. The best engines we've got, liquid hydrogen and oxygen, max out at 465 seconds of specific impulse. That's the measure of how efficiently you're burning fuel. And 465 seconds? That's pathetic when you're trying to cross 140 million miles of empty space. Think about it. To get to Mars on chemical fuel alone, 90% of your spacecraft is propellant. 90%. You're basically flying a giant gas tank with a tiny crew compartment bolted on top. Even Starship, the most powerful rocket ever built, would need multiple launches just to fuel up in orbit before heading to Mars. And after all that, you're still looking at six to nine months of travel time, six months? That's half a year of astronauts floating in a tin can, getting blasted by cosmic radiation, their bones turning to mush in zero gravity. Every extra day in space is another day closer to disaster. Medical studies show prolonged exposure to cosmic radiation significantly increases cancer risk and can cause cardiovascular damage. This isn't science fiction. This is the reality astronauts face on current mission profiles. That's exactly why nuclear thermal rockets are back on the table. And no, these aren't new. NASA tested them successfully in the 1970s, engines that ran for minutes at gigawatt power levels. The technology works. The data is there. Here's what makes them game-changing. They deliver three times the efficiency of chemical engines while producing similar thrust. Three times. You're getting the same power but using a third of the fuel. SpaceX hasn't officially announced nuclear starship, but leaked technical analysis reveals they've been studying it intensively. And the findings are striking. A nuclear starship wouldn't need a complete redesign. That 50-meter stainless steel tower, the heat shield tiles, the landing system, it all stays. The basic architecture that's taken years to develop and test doesn't get thrown away. The modifications required are significant but achievable. This is critical because starting from scratch would set the Mars program back by decades. Instead, engineers propose adapting the existing design with targeted upgrades. It's the difference between evolution and revolution. And in aerospace, evolution is usually the smarter bet. But before we get ahead of ourselves, there's one massive challenge that makes or breaks this entire concept. A nuclear reactor doesn't just produce thrust, it unleashes neutrons, gamma rays, and fission fragments in every direction. These aren't minor hazards. Gamma rays can penetrate metal. Neutrons can make materials radioactive just by passing through them. And Starship's current design wasn't built with this in mind. Those massive flaps on the sides, crucial for controlled re-entry, would scatter radiation straight back toward the crew compartment at the top of the vehicle. The proposed solution sounds simple. Retract them during engine operation. But think about the failure modes. What if the mechanism jams? What if one retracts and another doesn't? You've just created an asymmetric radiation field that could expose the crew to lethal doses. Traditional nuclear spacecraft solve this differently. They mount the reactor on a long boom, sometimes 50 meters or more, from the crew area. Physics is on your side here. Radiation spreads spherically, so doubling the distance quarters your exposure. It's called the inverse square law, and it's your best friend in space. But Starship can't use a boom. It needs to land vertically. It needs to survive atmospheric re-entry at thousands of miles per hour. You can't bolt a massive structure onto the side and expect it to work. So engineers propose something different. Shadow shielding. Place dense materials, tungsten for gamma rays, boron carbide for neutrons, directly between the reactor and the crew. You're creating a radiation shadow where humans can survive. The reactor sits 25 meters from the crew area. That distance alone reduces exposure to roughly 11,625th of the total radiation output. Add dedicated shielding, 
about 345 kilograms per engine, and you've got a survivable environment. Here's where it gets clever. Starship already carries 30 tons of liquid methane for landing maneuvers. Methane is hydrogen rich, and hydrogen absorbs neutrons exceptionally well. For most of the journey, you've got meters of liquid fuel sitting between the reactor and the crew. It's not just fuel, it's shielding, free protection that's already part of the design. The calculations suggest this could work, but could is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. Most nuclear rocket designs use liquid hydrogen. It's been the standard for decades because it produces the highest specific impulse, the best bang for your buck in terms of efficiency. But hydrogen comes with serious baggage. It boils at negative 253 degrees Celsius. You need complex insulation and active cooling systems to keep it from evaporating. And because hydrogen is incredibly light, you need massive tanks to carry a useful amount. This is why hydrogen-fueled spacecraft often look strange. They're mostly tank. The technical analysis compared three engine configurations, a lower-power hydrogen system, a high-power hydrogen system, and a high-power methane system. The methane configuration won. Not because it's more efficient per kilogram of fuel. It's not. But because it's denser. Liquid methane takes up far less volume than liquid hydrogen for the same mass of propellant. That means smaller tanks, more compact design, and crucially, Starship already uses methane for its Raptor engines. The ground infrastructure exists. The refueling systems are proven. You're building on what works rather than starting over. With methane, nuclear Starship could cut the Mars journey to 88 days, about three months. Under optimal planetary alignment, that drops to just 52 days, seven weeks. That's fast enough to dramatically reduce radiation exposure from cosmic rays during transit. It extends launch windows, potentially allowing round trips before Earth and Mars drift too far apart in their orbits. But here's the catch nobody wants to talk about. Methane-fueled nuclear thermal rockets lack extensive testing. Hydrogen engines have decades of research, ground tests, and flight heritage. Methane nuclear engines? We're in experimental territory you'd be betting billions of dollars in human lives on an unproven propulsion system. Starship's entire value proposition is reusability. Land it, inspect it, refuel it, fly it again. That's how you make space access affordable. That's how you build a Mars colony. Chemical Starship can do this. Land at Starbase, service the engines, launch a week later. Nuclear Starship destroys that model. Once you ignite a nuclear reactor in space, it stays intensely radioactive for weeks. The fuel elements, the reactor structure, even nearby components become activated, meaning they're now emitting radiation themselves. You can't just land this at Starbase and wheel it into the high bay for inspection. Anyone who gets close would receive a lethal dose within minutes. Even in space, radiation creates operational nightmares. How do you dock with another spacecraft when your engines are still hot? The International Space Station has strict radiation limits. A nuclear-powered vehicle couldn't approach without violating them. Refueling on Mars? You'd need robotic systems or heavily shielded facilities, infrastructure that doesn't exist. And then there's the fuel logistics problem. Nuclear Starship needs three times more methane than chemical Starship. Three times. Chemical engines burn methane and oxygen together which you can produce on Mars using the CO2 atmosphere and water ice. But nuclear thermal engines only heat the propellant. No combustion, no oxygen needed. So you're tripling your methane demand without any oxygen savings. That's a massive infrastructure challenge. You'd need to scale up Mars fuel production by 300% just for the nuclear variant. Every ton of additional equipment you send to Mars is a ton you're not sending as habitat modules or scientific instruments. These aren't small problems. They're fundamental challenges to the entire mission architecture. SpaceX is deep into Starship Block 3 development. The Raptor 3 engine is the centerpiece, a complete redesign that promises 40 tons more payload capacity. But Raptor 3 isn't flight ready. Engines are cycling through tests at the McGregor facility in Texas being pushed to failure to find weak points. The test stand at Starbase that's needed for integrated vehicle testing was destroyed in an explosion earlier this year. They're rebuilding, 
but it takes time, and that's just for chemical engines. The Raptor 3 uses full-flow stage combustion, one of the most complex engine cycles ever attempted. You have to spin up turbo pumps before you have propellant flow, but you need propellant flow to drive the turbo pumps. It's a chicken and egg problem solved through precise choreography of valves, igniters, and pressure control. Getting it wrong by milliseconds can destroy the engine. Adding nuclear thermal propulsion multiplies that complexity exponentially. A nuclear reactor isn't just an engine. It's a controlled fission reaction that has to operate reliably in the vibration, acceleration, and thermal environment of spaceflight. The engineering required is orders of magnitude harder than even the most advanced chemical system. The analysis assumes a mature, flight-ready nuclear engine. But that doesn't exist yet. Ground tests from the 1970s prove the concept. Recent experiments have validated some components. But building a space-rated nuclear thermal rocket that can survive launch, operate for months, and not kill the crew? That's a decade-long development program at minimum, probably longer. Starship Block 3 is targeting early 2026 for orbital flights. Nuclear Starship, 2030s, if everything goes perfectly. More realistically, 2040s. Here's what the mainstream coverage isn't telling you. Nuclear propulsion isn't just about Mars missions. It fundamentally changes what's possible in cislunar space, asteroid operations, and, let's be honest, military applications. A spacecraft that cuts transit times by 70% helps anyone who needs speed in space. Satellite servicing missions that currently take weeks could happen in days. Space debris removal becomes economically viable when you can reach multiple targets on a single mission. Rapid response to emerging threats, whether that's a failing satellite or something more concerning, becomes possible. The strategic implications are massive. China is developing nuclear propulsion. Russia has been working on nuclear tugs for years. Whoever achieves reliable, reusable nuclear propulsion first gains a decisive advantage in space operations. Not just scientific advantage, strategic advantage. NASA knows this. SpaceX knows this. The Pentagon definitely knows this. The question isn't whether nuclear propulsion is coming. The question is, who gets there first and what happens when they do? This is exactly why nuclear propulsion matters. Chemical rockets have taken us as far as they can. Nine months to Mars isn't sustainable. 90% fuel loads aren't efficient. We've reached the limit. Nuclear thermal engines offer three times the efficiency, cutting Mars trips to potentially 52 days. That's the difference between survival and thriving in deep space. The challenges are real. Radiation shielding, operational complexity, unproven methane systems. But SpaceX has a track record of solving impossible problems. They landed rockets. They're catching boosters midair. Nuclear Starship is the logical next step. Here's what's happening next. Starship block three targets early 2026 for orbital flights. That's the foundation. Nuclear development is already underway in the background. Research, testing, design work. By the 2030s, we could see the first nuclear-powered interplanetary missions. And whoever gets there first controls the future of space. The space race is heating up. China and Russia are pursuing nuclear propulsion aggressively. America's response will define the next 50 years in space. What's your take? Should SpaceX prioritize nuclear development or focus on perfecting chemical Starship first? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this breakdown valuable, hit that like button. Subscribe to Space Hub for deep dives into real space technology. No hype, just facts. And turn on notifications so you don't miss our next analysis. This is Space Hub. We're tracking the future of spaceflight as it happens.